What you're looking at is a set of lecture notes that I typed up a while ago along with the PowerPoint that corresponds with it. What I've asked you to do is to use the kind of set of notes that have some blanks in it to go along with this lecture and complete it. Now, this is not out of chapter 21 from your textbook. It actually more corresponds with chapter 23, the evolution of populations, but it's the same information and so you shouldn't worry about that. Well, as a basis for what we're getting onto here is that there are unique characteristics of individual organisms that affect its survival, its reproductive success, and its offspring success. And the genetic variation influences these characteristics and provides fodder for natural selection. In other words, without genetic variation, we wouldn't see these changes over time. And natural populations of organisms contain so much genetic variability on the genetic level and therefore the frequencies of their alleles in the population will change in response to evolutionary forces. So what we'll be talking about are these topics, gene variation, the Hardy-Weinberg principle, agents of evolutionary change, how we measure fitness, how the different evolutionary forces interact, various forms of selection, and limits to selection. So what we'll begin with is the idea that genetic variation is raw material. And if it seems like I'm reading right off of my notes here, it's because I typed them, so it's pretty much my voice on paper. Without having genetic variation, evolution could not occur. You have to have that, those changes in alleles in order for populations to change over time. So what is evolution? Just a little reminder, it's descent with modification. And evolution is just how an entity or a population of organisms will change through time. By the way, the term evolution was not even used by Darwin himself in his first five editions of his very famous book, the origin of, on the origin of species. It wasn't until his sixth edition that that even came up. So descent with modification says that th through time species accumulate differences as a result when new species form the descendant species differ from their ancestors and that's how Darwin put descent with modification. So what is natural selection? Let's remind ourselves of what this mechanism is in order to achieve evolution. So natural selection is the mechanism by which evolution occurs and that's something I'd like you to think about that the natural selection is the mechanism evolution is the outcome. So in a population some individuals have heritable traits that cause them to have a higher reproductive success RS is reproductive success than individuals without those traits. So over time, the entire population could acquire a higher proportion of individuals with these traits or advantageous characteristics. This leads to the evolution of the population, which is now better adapted to its local environmental pressures. But this isn't how scientists always viewed nature. You might remember from regular biology learning about a scientist named Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. I know that's a really bad French accent. And Lamarck had the idea of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And in this, he stated that individual organisms acquire physical and behavioral changes during their lifetime and then pass these on to their offspring. So for example, he would have explained that shorter neck giraffes repeatedly stretch their necks to forage on foods high above therefore stretching their necks over time, this trait that they acquired during their lifetime would then be passed on to their offspring. Not really likely. Darwin instead said that there was pre-existing variation or genetic differences among the individuals which created variation <clears throat> in their offspring. Those that had the longer necks gave birth to those with longer necks, etc. And this would be how the populations would change over time. And this PowerPoint slide over here explains that, so if you'd like to pause for a second to read it over, feel free. What I want to type right here, I'm going to add a little something, is a term called microevolution. You should add this to your notes. This is a term that you might see. 
So what I've written here is this idea of microevolution because we'll talk later about macroevolution. Microevolution is simply a change in allele frequencies of a population over generations. This, of course, is caused by mutations, which would create new genes and alleles. For example, point mutations and whole chromosomal mutations. Most variation in populations actually comes from sexual recombination of alleles that already exist in a population. This occurs during crossing over or independent assortment. Remember, you've got 22, excuse me, 2 to the 23rd different combinations when you form gametes. And of course, fertilization, where you have 2 to the 23rd times 2 to the 23rd when you have consider the different gamete combinations and when they come together. So quite a bit of variation right there. Some other causes of population evolution, repeated mutations in alleles, migration, either emigration, if that's when organisms leave their population, that can change the frequency of some alleles, either increasing or decreasing. Immigration, an individual coming into a population could introduce new alleles to a population. And small populations and chance effects. We'll talk about bottleneck effects and founder effects, which we've discussed in the past. So kind of the take home of this section is that Darwin proposed that natural selection on that natural selection on variants within a population will lead, lead to evolutionary change. So let's look at genetic variation in nature. Before we talk about what population genetics is, let's remember what a population is. Hopefully you do remember, but let's write it down in case you get confused on what it means. So a population is simply a group of individuals of the same species living in the same area and interbreeding, producing viable and fertile offspring. So population genetics is where we study the properties of the genes in entire populations. And it's very important to understand that while diversity occurs on the level of the individual, evolution occurs on the level of the population. So please, I'm going to highlight this. This is so important for you to know. Evolution does not occur on the individual level, but on the population level. No single organism, as cool as they may be, can evolve. They may acclimate to changing environments, but they don't ever adapt, which is what the, the term that we use when we talk about evolution. So how do we measure levels of genetic variation? And how much is actually out there? Well, one thing that we can look at is how genes influence blood groups in humans. There are over 30 blood group genes in the humans beyond the ABO locus. We've talked about the blood type alleles, but there are more than what we've discussed. Remember, by the way, that a locus is just the site of a gene on a chromosome. But only a third of these are commonly found. There are also over 45 different genes that encode proteins in blood cells and plasma. Something else we can look at is how genes influence enzymes. We identify variable alleles with electrophoresis, which I've explained here, but you know what that looks like now. Well, as soon as you see your gel, you will. This is where they're using some backlit illumination or some fluorescence to visualize their, um, their fragments. Only about 5% of the genes that encode enzymes are heterozygous in each human. So read that carefully. Only about 5% of the genes in, our, in the human genome that code for enzymes are heterozygous, meaning the rest are homozygous. That's very significant. And genetic variation is the rule in nature. So how do those enzymes change over time if there's very little variation? They probably don't. Here's a picture of electrophoresis, which you can take a look at. In nature, we can study the idea of enzyme polymorphism by taking a look at the variety of enzymes or gene encoding enzymes, I said that wrong, enzyme encoding genes in a gene pool. And a gene pool, remember, these are, maybe I should type this just in case, gene pool. 
So the gene pool are all the alleles at all loci in the members of a population or all of the genetic information for a population. Polymorphism. This is the idea of having many forms. The presence of over one allele at one locus in a population at frequencies higher than can be expect, explained by mutational low is over five, which is only 5%. So in other words, alleles can be polymorphic or you can have multiple alleles. Most insect and plant populations are polymorphic at at least half of their loci that encode for enzymes, but it's not quite so high in vertebrates. The idea of heterozygosity is a probability that a randomly selected gene will be heterozygous for a randomly selected individual. And this varies for Drosophila and other invertebrates. It's about 15%, 5 to 8% in vertebrates, and 8% in non-fertilizing, non-self-fertilizing plants. So if we were to consider this idea of DNA sequence polymorphism, we can sequence DNA in Drosophila, and it's shown us that they have tremendous variation in both their exons and introns, and we don't necessarily see that for all organisms. I'm going to add a little note right here. So if you don't have heterozygosity, with it, what does that mean? So if a population has no heterozygosity for a certain locus, then that allele is said to be fixed. In other words, there's no other option besides the one that you see. And the take home message for this section is that natural populations contain a lot of genetic variation. However, what we see, the amount of genetic variation that we see is much, much greater than can be accounted for by mutation alone. I'm going to pause here and I'll record a second segment in a moment.